Oh, some glad morning when the slap is o'er, I'll fly away to our home on God's western shore. Welcome everyone uh, this morning to Cornerstone. Uh, what a blessed day it is to be in the house of the Lord. And not only that, uh, just I want you to be thinking about how Lord, the Lord has worked in your life this week. You know, a lot of times we lose the opportunity or we forget to take the opportunity to reflect on what God has done in our lives. As a matter of fact, we have a lot to be grateful for, so much to be grateful for. As a matter of fact, the verse that we're going to be reading in, is in chapter Five of First John, and if you could be turning to that, I do want to make an announcement this morning. Um, we uh, we had a case of COVID in our Mother's Day Out program, and in a, an abundance of caution, we uh, we've had to close down the program for about two weeks, and hopefully that'll be kicked back off uh, at the beginning of next month. But because the, a lot of the teachers that were going to be working in uh, the, the vacation Bible school that was coming up here in about a week and a half, those teachers are unavailable because they're on quarantine. So we have postponed, we have postponed the uh, VBS program until maybe uh, towards fall. So be in prayer for Deanna as she's prepared a lot, of, done a lot of work. We need to be praying for her that, that as we gear up for this fall VBS that uh, the Lord will bring the workers that we need in order to do that. So uh, I do want to, if you could stand and honor reading God's word. We have the discipleship class that's coming tonight at five o'clock, and I, I would invite all of you here to that, either online or in person. But John, 1 John chapter 5, verse 1, whoever believes that Jesus is the Christ is born of God. And whoever loves the father loves the child born of him. But this we know, that 
that we love the children of God when we love God and observe his commandments. For this is the love of God that we keep his commandments and his commandments are not burdensome. Whenever, for whatever is born of God overcomes the world and this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. As a matter of fact, tonight we're going to be talking about what it is to have Bible-based faith. Bible-based faith. Many of us don't have a full understanding of what really faith is. Many of us think faith is just having faith in faith. Well, faith is founded on the fundamentals that God gives us in his word, and we'll be talking about that tonight. So let us pray. Heavenly Father, I ask that you would give us an opportunity to hear your word this morning uh, as Brother Jim brings your word, and uh, I ask that you would help us be able to receive it. Help us to have the faith that you give us that you promise us. Heavenly Father, I pray that you glorify yourself in your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, this morning. I pray that we are able to receive what you have given us in Jesus Christ. It is in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. So aimless my life here. Oh, I would let my dear Savior in. Then Jesus came like a stranger. Oh, praise the Lord. I saw the light. I saw the light. Oh, I saw the light. No more of darkness. No more in night. Now I'm so happy, no sorrow. Prison for me, I'm glory bound by Jesus. 
Isn't that good? Thank you, Jesus. Good to see everybody here this morning. If you have your Bibles, let's turn to 2 Samuel chapter 23. A lot of our folks on the road, traveling, vacation time. I counted 14 this morning that I know that's uh, on the road, traveling, and some coming back home. Some are on their way today, but uh, pray for all of those who are on the road during this time of the year. The Lord will bring them all safely back to us. 2 Samuel chapter 23. Uh, I hope when you came in this morning you got an outline called Victory in a Pea Patch. If you do not have an outline, I know uh, Brett and the guys are ready to pass out these outlines. Anybody need an outline? Anybody need an outline up here? Miss Cheryl needs one, please. Right over here, Brian. Miss Cheryl needs one. Anybody else over here? 2 Samuel chapter 23, we're going to welcome those who are online this morning watching. Grateful that you've come to be a part of our worship service this morning. I want to introduce my oldest daughter, my firstborn, Sandy, and my granddaughter, Tiffany, who's named after our daughter who went home to be with Jesus, little Tiffany Michelle. They're here from Austin this weekend because we had a wedding Wednesday night, uh, Friday night for Ken folks. But Sandy and Tiff are here. Would you raise your hand? Love you guys. They're all masked up. You can tell they live in Austin. But anyway, praise the Lord. It's good to have my, my firstborn and my baby girl Tiffany with us today. Praise the Lord. Guys, you know, we've been waiting for the last several weeks for the green light uh, of the Holy Spirit to lead us in this message this morning. And uh, so it's just, it's time for America. Uh, <clears throat> if there's ever been a message that our country needs today, it's victory in the pea patch. Uh, you know, we're celebrating our 245th birthday, July 4th, as a nation. So the month of July, we're just thinking about America, uh, thinking about our national anthem. I want to say we only got one national anthem. We don't have two national anthems. Our national anthem is not about race, and our national anthem is not about skin color. Our national anthem is not about religion. Our national anthem is about our freedom. And so, uh, 
need to understand that, folks. Uh, America, if there's ever been a time that she needs our prayers, it's now. And so um, I just pray that the Holy Spirit will speak to your heart as he's spoken to mine. And that uh, we'll just keep our eyes on Jesus. Amen. Second Samuel chapter 23. If you got it, say you got it. Let's stand in honor of God's word together. Second Samuel chapter 23. Please keep your Bibles. Do not close your Bibles. In verses 11 and 12, there's words we're going to ask you to underscore here in a few moments. But 2 Samuel chapter 23, beginning with verse 11. And after him was Shema, the son of Agi, the Agi. And the Philistines were gathered together into a troop. The Philistines, you know, were Israel's arch enemy. And the Philistines were gathered together in a troop where there was a piece of ground full of lentils. That's peas, a pea patch. Lentils is peas. And the people fled from the Philistines. But Shema stood in the midst of the ground and defended it and slew the Philistines and the Lord wrought a great victory. Victory in a pea patch. Every head bowed, every eye closed. Let's all pray this prayer together, please. Those that are at home, would you join us? Heavenly Father, please speak to our hearts. Touch lives. If there's anyone here lost, anyone home lost, Holy Spirit, you do the work that only you can do. Please, Holy Spirit, give us ears to hear this morning what the Word of God and the Spirit of God would say to each and every one of us. We stand, Lord, today for America. And Heavenly Father, we pray that our country would turn back to Jesus. Lord, uh, we desperately need you as a nation and as a people. We thank you, Lord, again, Holy Spirit, for your presence here. And we give you all the honor and glory and praise as the mighty name of Jesus, exalted and magnified. For we ask it in Jesus' name and all God's people said, Amen. you may be seated. Shema was one of the mighty men of David. When you study 2 Samuel, you'll find out that many of David's mighty men are mentioned. There were three of the greatest mighty men of David, and Shema was one of those three. If you continue to read the story in other um, books in the Old Testament, you'll know that Shema, that day that he fought the Philistines, he killed 300, 300 against one. The Philistines attacked this ground of lentil peas. He defended it, and 300 of the enemies were slain. Were, 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 were slayed. I want you to notice four things about Shema. Number one, if you're taking notes, I want you to notice when he stood. When he stood. When he stood. The Bible says that Shema stood. Would you fill in the blanks? Shema stood in the midst of a crisis. He stood in the midst of a crisis. The enemies of Israel had invaded the land once again. There was a crisis in Israel. And Shema stood up against the enemies. Today in America, we're in a crisis. We're in a moral crisis and a spiritual crisis like this nation has never known before. Would you write down some things? We have some of the crisis today. We have liberalism in our churches today in America. Liberalism in our churches. We have preachers who are no longer preaching the Word of God. They're giving bedtime stories. They're afraid they're going to offend somebody. They're trying to be politically correct instead of scripturally correct. I found out a long time ago, friends, it's uh, easier to please one than to please a multitude. When we preach, when we sing, when you teachers teach, we preach, we sing, we play the instruments, 
whatever you do for the kingdom, we do it for an audience of one. I'm not, this message is not to please you. This message is not to please the elders. This message is not preached to please the denomination. This message is not to please me. It's a whole lot easier, friends, to please the Lord. And when you please the Lord, it don't matter whom you displease. But if you displease the Lord, it don't matter whom you please. Today in America, we have liberalism in our churches. Would you write it down? We have apostasy in our pulpits. Apostasy in our pulpits. The Bible says in 1 Timothy 4.1 in your outline, this is the last days. It says, now the Spirit especially says that in the latter times, some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of demons. If we have apostasy in many of our pulpits, number two, we have apathy in our pews. We have apathy in our pews in America. I mentioned the other day that the last church age is the Laodicean church age in Revelation chapter 3. And the characteristics of Laodicea is neither hot nor cold. It is lukewarm. We're living in a lukewarm age in America where God's people is neither hot nor cold. There's liberalism in our church. We have a crisis today in this nation. We have liberalism in our churches, apostasy in many of our pulpits, apathy in many of our pews. Number two, would you write it down? If we've got liberalism in our churches, number two, we've got secularism in our schools. We have secularism in our schools. Would you look at your outline? It mentions the NEA. Do you all see that, please? At home, do you see the NEA? That's the National Education Association of America. It's the largest teachers union in America. They have announced that the first priority is making racist, anti-American indoctrination mandatory in every classroom from K through 12th grade. We didn't have secularism as a boy when I grew up. We had old-fashioned patriotism. We loved the red, white, and blue. We loved the history of America. We loved the flag of America. We loved the landmarks of America. We loved the history of America. That's all changed. I'm going to make a statement. You never heard it before in your life. I want you to look up here. If you're playing on your iPhone, I want you to look up here. I had a funeral yesterday, Scurry, Texas, and a man was sitting about three rows in front of me, messing with his iPhone. I said, sir, if you get off that stinking rotten iPhone and pay attention, you might get saved. Can I have some help, please? Thank God I had 20 saved yesterday. God's still in the saving business. Listen to this statement. Brother Tommy, you'll love this. If we keep sending our children to Caesar for their education, don't be surprised when they come home acting like Romans. I want to say that one more time because it's good. If we keep sending our children to Caesar for their education, they're going to come home don't be surprised when they come home acting like Romans. Now let's bring it to 2021, America. If we keep sending our children and grandchildren to secular schools, don't be surprised when they come home hating America and hating Christian values. That's the truth. America is not a racist nation. They're teaching our kids doctrine from hell. America is a good nation. It's got its faults. It's got its flaws. It's got its failures. But it's the best nation in the world. 
I'm proud to be an American. I'm not going to let liberals tear us down without standing up for what's right. Secularism in our schools to indoctrinate our babies to hate America and to hate Christian values. That's the Democrat agenda. That's George Soros' agenda. That's the liberals in Hollywood agenda. That's these liberal judges' agenda. For one, I will not remain silent. If the time comes they start arresting preachers for preaching the truth, I'm hoping I'm preaching this message when they come in here to arrest me. Because I'll be gladly to go. And on the way out, I'll still be preaching Jesus. I don't fear Caesar, okay? I don't fear liberals. You see, Shema, when did he stand up? He stood up in a crisis. Today, we have a moral and spiritual crisis in America. We have liberalism in our churches. We've got secularism in our schools. Number three, would you write it down? We have materialism in our homes. Materialism in our homes. Your brother Jim, what are you talking about? There are many families today in America who are so busy making a living, they forgot to make a life for their children. Don't have time for Jesus. Don't have time for the church because they're out there trying to make. Thank you. Let me preach it, Linda, please. Always got one in the crowd. There was a crisis today in America. Liberalism in our churches, secularism in our schools, Materialism in our homes, and number four, there's paganism now in this country. America used to be a Christian nation. The fastest growing church in America, write it down in your outline, the fastest growing church in America is the unchurched. That's the fastest growing church in America is the unchurched. We can fill up all kinds of sports venues. We can fill up all kinds of recreation venues. But the church, many of our churches remain empty. Today in America, there's paganism in our nation. Many are anti, and they're very bold about it. They're anti-Jesus. You can talk about God all you want to, but don't you mention Jesus. They're anti-Bible. They're anti-church. When did Shema stand, church? He stood in a crisis. Everybody look up here. At home, there's ever been a time we need to stand for America is right now. We are in a crisis. And if you don't believe that, you're smoking something. It ought to be against the law. But Colorado and California and all these other liberal states are legalizing marijuana. That's another straight from hell. And Shema stood in a pea patch. When did he stand? Number two, would you write it down? Notice the way he stood. This is so good. Please notice the way he stood. Would you look at verse 11 again? And after him was Shema, the Exiot, the Hariot, the Philistines were gathered together into a troop which is a, where it was a piece of ground full of lentils. And the people fled from the Philistines, but notice he stood. But everybody say, he stood. 
Would you fill in the blanks? Do you notice how he stood, uh, Donovan? The Bible says he stood alone. Fill in the blanks, guys. The Bible says everybody else fled. Did y'all get that, church? The Bible says everybody else fled. Everybody else fled. Everybody else fled. But guess what? Shema stood alone. And how did he stand? He, st he stood distinctively. He stood boldly. He stood courageously. And God gave him a victory. Because you see, little is much when God's in it. God still used the minority. He did with Gideon. He started off with 32,000 men and God cut him down to 300 and defeated the Midianites because God can do more with 300 committed men than 32,000 cowards. God's not looking for thousands. He's just looking for that man. He's looking for that woman. He's looking for that young person today in America who'll stand like Shema. How'd he stand, church? He stood alone. Look at your outline. Mark it down in this day. When you and I stand for righteousness, when we stand up for the truth, when we stand up for things that are honest, when we stand up for things that are true, get ready, folks. You're probably going to have to stand alone. But remember this. Start writing down fast, please. Noah stood alone. Can I have some help, please? Noah stood alone. Noah stood alone. Elijah, write him down. Elijah on Mount Carmel. He stood alone. There were 400 false prophets, but Elijah stood alone. Woo! Fill in the blanks. David stood alone against Goliath. I need some help, please. I don't see anybody else there fighting the giant. Can I have some help, church? Shema stood alone. David stood alone when he fought Goliath. Daniel stood alone in the lion's den. Daniel stood alone. I didn't see him throwing anybody else in the lion's den that day. Can I have some help, church? God didn't have to drag him in there screaming and whining and whimping about it. He stood alone. John the Baptist, write him down. John the Baptist stood alone against King Herod. He was all by himself when he called King Herod out for his immorality. We got preachers today scared to death to preach about immorality. From the White House, the courthouse, schoolhouse, church house. Sin is still sin. We're afraid we're going to offend somebody. John the Baptist, you said, well, it cost him his head. Herod cut off his head. That may be true, but Herod didn't have his heart. He stood alone. I love Shema. Some of you have never heard about Shema. I know you've never heard a message about him, but I hope you appreciate him again, for he's one of David's mighty men, and he's in God's Hall of Fame. Because he is willing to stand alone. Look at the next one. Stephen stood alone. He was the first martyr of the church. The first person to die was Stephen. He was the first person to die for Jesus. After Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection and ascension. The first Christian to die. The first Christian ever to die. And there's been millions after him. But Stephen, the first martyr of the church, he died alone. Paul stood alone. 
when he stood up against Nero. Nero condemned Paul for his head to be cut off. He didn't care. Just like John the Baptist. Nero could have his head, but Jesus had his heart. I want you to start mentioning every one of these persons we just wrote down one at a time. Start it off, please. Start, everybody say it. He stood alone. Just one at a time. Do, do it again. He stood alone. Go ahead. He stood alone on Mount Carmel. Stood alone against Goliath. Stood alone in the lion's den. Stood alone against King Herod. Stood alone against the Sanhedrin. Stood alone against Nero. Put down Jesus because he stood alone at Calvary. Woo! Jesus stood alone at Calvary. He could have called 10,000 angels. Actually, 72,000. He could have called 72,000 angels. But guess what? Jesus, Jesus, Jesus stood alone for me and he stood alone for you. Because if he had called in for reinforcements like you and I would, you and I would be going to hell right now. Thank God, Brother Roy, we have a Savior who stood alone. Even his disciples wouldn't stand with him. They weren't there. In this day and time, in 2021, we got three more years of this idiot Biden, Kamala Harris. But 2021, there's going to be times, look up here, America, those who love America and those who are God's people, unashamed of being called God's children. Those who are unashamed of the Lord Jesus Christ and the truth of God's word. We're going to find ourselves more and more having to stand alone. At work tomorrow. Used to be easy to stand for Jesus, but not anymore. Some of you are going to go back to that office tomorrow that's a that's anti God and anti Jesus. You're going to have to go to work tomorrow. Some of you here, some online. You go to work tomorrow, some of us are going to have to stand alone. School is about to start in a few weeks. Many of our young people, many of our young people, when they go back to school this fall, they're going to have to stand alone. We got young people in this church. Or having to stand alone in their homes. When a young lady got saved the other day, her family's Mormon. But she got gloriously saved. Wept her way into the kingdom of God. Gave her heart and life to Jesus knowing exactly what was going to happen when she got home. She told her parents that she gave her life to Jesus. They weren't happy. That's fine. We pray for her parents. It's okay. But that little girl is standing alone right now. And I pray for her every day. Her name is Olivia. Some of you won't write her name down. You'll forget it as soon as I just said it. That little girl needs our prayers. She is upset that she couldn't be baptized. I told her, I said, Olivia, it don't matter. You've done the most important thing. Can I have some help, please? And being baptized or not, that's on your parents, not you. Can I have some help, please? We're going to find ourselves having to stand alone like never before. But look up, look up here, church. For Jesus' sake, for America's sake, let's keep on standing. Would you write that down at the bottom of your outline? That's the blanks in your bottom of your outline. For Jesus' sake, for America's sake, 
Let's keep on standing. Notice number three. Not only when he stood, the way he stood, but notice where he stood. Notice where he stood, and I want you to underscore something again. Please do not miss this. Look at verse 12. I want you to underscore two words or three words. Look at verse 12. Do you have it? If you got it, verse 12, underscore three words. But he stood, now notice the next three words, in the midst. Everybody say, in the midst. That means right in the middle. You know what this blesses me? This is so good. Shema didn't give an appearance that he was standing. I know a lot of Christians who give an appearance that they're standing for Jesus. It's just an appearance, though. Because when, when it gets hot in the kitchen, they back out. You see, this man was right in the middle. He didn't want nobody. You didn't, look up here. You didn't have to guess where Shema stood. He wasn't on the outside. He wasn't on the far side. He wasn't on the left side. He wasn't on the back side. He was right in the middle. Everybody knew where he stood. And you know how he stood? He just stood distinctively, again, courageously and boldly, and God gave him the victory. Please, dear Jesus, please, dear Jesus, give us men and women, boys and girls, young people, like Shema who will stand today, not just give an appearance for Jesus, not just give an appearance that we're standing for the truth, but we'll stand up for Jesus. We'll stand up for the truth of God's word boldly, distinctively, courageously. Amen. Not going to make many friends. This kind of preaching, you either love it or hate it. There's, not, there's no in-between, and I love that. It's either love or hate, this kind of preaching. I'm not going to go to a church where I just walk out and I don't feel nothing. Either I want to hate the messenger or I'm going to love it. And let me tell you, you come here, you're not going to be in the middle of what you think about the service. You're going to scratch your head and say, wonder what he meant, wonder what he said. Can I have some help, please? It's a dirty, rotten shame that's the way it is today. But we need to stand in the midst. It wasn't popular to do it, Tiffany. You're fixing to be a junior at Austin Westlake High School. And Austin, I was just like all of you, I pray every day by name for my grandchildren. They need more prayers than my children did. When he stood... Where he stood. I don't want you to notice number four. This is the most important one. Could you write it down, please? Notice why he stood. Now this this is oh boy. Woo! Guys, let's be honest. Everybody look up here. Let's be honest. What was this guy fighting for and willing to die for? Let's be honest. He was fighting for a pea patch. <laughs> Kathy and I got some tomatoes growing out in the back. I'm not fighting. No, I can't even fight the bugs off them suckers. Are you out there, please? Are you out there, please? I can't. I, I didn't tell my wife this morning because I knew she'd get in the flesh. But I went out there to check our tomatoes. And guess what? You know what I found there? You know what, I, what you always look for? What, what, what was it? Tell them. A bunny rabbit. And I shoot him off because my wife's going to kill every bunny rabbit that gets in her garden. <laughs> I'm out there this morning trying to protect that bunny. Get out of here, son. My wife's coming any minute. She's headed to church. Get out of here. <laughs> it's crazy. The older I get, I become an animal lover. I used to shoot them all the time. Guys, look up here. Let's be honest. What's this guy fighting for? He's fighting for a 
patch of peas. But you know why he's fighting for a patch of peas? Because they were God's peas. <laughs> he was fighting because they were God's peas. You see, there's some things worth fighting for. There's some things worth fighting for. People say, why do you fight for that? It ain't so much. It's God's peace. These four things that I'm about to share with you, these are things that God wants us to stand up and fight for. There's some things worth fighting for. Number one, would you write it down? We need to fight for family values. We need to fight for family values. I thought I had more amens from, we're not in Hollywood, we're not in California. I wouldn't expect any amens from those people. But here in Texas, you remain silent, you're a disgrace to grace. There's some things worth fighting for. And I don't care where you live, but let me tell you, family values are something we ought to be willing to fight for. The sanctity of our home and the sacredness of marriage ought to be fought for. Fill in the blanks. We will not condone what God's Word condemns. We will not condone what God's Word condemns. We don't condemn the sinner. We condemn the sin. God loves sinners. He loves me because I'm a sinner just like you. But He hates sin. That's why He went to the cross. We will not condone what God's word condemns. There's some things worth fighting for. Family values. Number two, would you write it down? The fundamentals of our faith are worth fighting for. The fundamentals of our faith as Christians, the Christian faith. Everyone look at the scripture there in Psalms, verse 11, chapter 11, verse 3. It says, if the foundations be destroyed, what will the righteous do? Please, church, look up here. This book's worth fighting for. The virgin birth is worth fighting for. Because if Jesus hadn't been born of a virgin... He could have never been our Savior. His virtuous life is worth fighting for. He wasn't just a good old boy. He was the God man. It's a problem now. We got too many good old boys and not enough God men. Some things are worth fighting for. His death on the cross, his vicarious death, his substitutionary death on the cross, it's worth fighting for. His victorious resurrection is worth fighting for. Because if Jesus is still in that tomb, folks, you and I have no hope of heaven. The one thing that separates Christianity from all the other false religions in this world, from Islam to the other false religions, is that empty tomb. And that's worth fighting for, my friends. Because if Jesus was still in that tomb like Muhammad is in his tomb in Mecca, friends, you and I could never be saved. I say his resurrection is worth fighting for. I'll tell you something else worth fighting for. His visible return. And I can hardly wait. Some things are worth fighting for. What, what in the world did Shammai was willing to fight and die for was a pea patch. By the way, I, I, I missed something. Look at the top of your outline because I want to make sure you get it about old. I want to make sure you get this about old Shema. Did you see where it says Shema was a one man? Do you all see that? I want you to put it down. Shema was a one man God squad for God's pods. It'll take you a while to kick that in, but that's real good. Shema was a one-man God squad for God's pods. Some things are worth fighting for, Brother Mark. Number three. 
Freedom for the unborn is worth fighting for. America has blood on its hands. Over 50 million people, 50 million babies been aborted since 19. 50 million innocent unborn babies slaughtered and Biden and Harris and the rest of the Democrats want to support with tax support abortions overseas. That is straight from hell. Send this message to Politico. Please send this message to Don Lemon and CNN. I could care less. There's some things worth fighting for. Every one of us here this morning, we need to take about five seconds to thank your mother that she didn't believe in abortion. Now that I preach, thank your mother. You're here today, aren't you? Because she didn't believe in abortion. Pulpits have been silent too long. Christians have been silent too long. While we're slaughtering 4,500 unborn children every day. Look at your outline, please. The Bible says in Proverbs 31, speak up for those who can't speak for themselves. I want you to write these three ways that we can speak up for the unborn this morning. Number one, by preaching God's word. By preaching God's word. You know what God's word says about, is our God pro-life or is he pro-choice? You don't have to guess. You don't have to wonder. Our God's pro-life. Preach God, look at Deuteronomy 30, look what it says. God says, I call heaven and earth to record this day against you that I've set before you life and death, blessing and cursing, therefore choose life. God is pro-life, not pro-choice. Both thou and thy seed may live. We can speak up for the unborn by preaching the word. Number two, write down the word pose, P O L L. Apostrophe S, pose. You say, what are you talking about, pose? Check the voting records of the candidates. Well, I got about five amens on that. You got to be an absolute idiot moron to go in there and vote for one. You better check the parties. We don't, we're not party people. We're principal people. We don't vote parties. We vote principles found right here in this book. Let the record state America, God's people, will never vote for a Democrat or anybody else who believes in murdering unborn children. Amen. Let the record be known. We will never vote for a Democrat or anyone else who wants to kill unborn babies. Oh, it's fixing to get worse than that. You just keep, everybody look up here. I hope some of you get so sick you can't eat when you go home. Let the record be stated, Chris. Has there ever been a pro-life family? It's the Blevins family. They're like rabbits. They got kids all over the place. Nothing wrong with that. I'm bringing these babies up, love Jesus. We need more of them like them. Amen. Kath and I had, had a whole lot more children. Our firstborn, Sandy, there ever was a perfect child, it was her. She's 50 years old, she's still that way. Before we had children, I was a youth pastor in Southern California when I got back from Vietnam. I remember standing up there in Southern California preaching to Brother Bill Davenport, my pastor, said, I want you to preach Sunday night. I said, man, I'd love to. He said, what are you going to preach on? He said, why don't you preach on the home and family? Kathy and I have been married about two years. But I knew all about it. <laughs> I still got the outline of my first message on home and family. Titled, How to Raise Children. And we didn't have any. <laughs> By the time we had our third one, Josh, I stopped preaching on how to raise a family.
Seems like the more you have, the less you know. <laughs> but what a joy all three of them have been and are to Kathy and I. But let the record state, please, Brother Tommy. Those who are willing to mur murder the unborn. Those who are willing to murder the unborn should never be trusted to govern the living. Because they'll kill babies. They'll kill us senior citizens too. When we're no longer productive, I don't care about me. I'm caring about my babies. But let the record state those who are willing to kill the unborn should never be trusted to govern the living. Let the reborn stand up for the unborn. Some things are worth fighting for. And those little babies are worth fighting for. We can speak up for the unborn by preaching God's word, by the pose. Number three, most important, write it down, by prayers. By our prayers. I don't want you to miss this, please, church. At home, would you look at the scripture with me there in Proverbs 22? Please, everybody look at this scripture in Proverbs 22, 1. It says this. The king's heart is in the hand of the Lord as the rivers of water. God turneth it whithersoever he will. And guys, look up here. If God can turn the heart of kings... He can turn the heart of our Supreme Court justices to reverse the 1973 decision of murdering unborn children. He can do it. We had a president for four years who got pro-life judges on the Supreme Court. And America hated him for it. Kevin all, they crucified him because he's pro-life. If anything President Trump did for our country, he, he put pro-life judges on the Supreme Court. There's some things worth fighting for. If I didn't love America, I wouldn't be preaching with a broken heart. It's not for me, it's for them. And one of these days I won't be here any longer and that's fine. Someone needs to speak up. whether it's popular or not, to preach the truth. Some things are worth fighting for. Number four, write it down. Our freedom, the future of America is worth fighting for. The future of America The Bible says, blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord. And there's still hope for America because God's still on his throne. You're fixing to hear a song that I first heard at First Baptist Church, Saxe, when I pastored there. 
Y'all were there. We had this man come from from the south. You were there. Y'all were there. You'll know it as soon as I say it. Michael Combs. Michael Combs and we had him at First Baptist Church, Saxe. Had an anointed service when he came because he's an anointed songwriter and he's an anointed singer. But he wrote a song a number of years ago about America. It's one of my favorite songs. And I really feel we need to hear it. As we're fighting for a pea patch called America. A lot of people don't think it's worth fighting for anymore, but there's millions of young men and women fighting for this country this morning. Our precious police officers are fighting for it this morning. There's millions of Americans who say America is still worth fighting for. I want you to listen to the words. They can take Turn up. Turn it up. the Ten Commandments off the courthouse walls. They can even take all the manger seeds out of the parks and malls. They can take my blessed Bible Tear the pages all apart But they'll never take my Jesus Out of my heart They can take away our rights to pray Saul in jail, but they can't take away the life he gave, or send my soul to hell. Yeah, they can take my blessed Bible. Out of my heart They can take away Our liberty To preach God's holy word They can make it be against the law If we witness door to door Oh, they can stop our boys From preaching in the streets Oh, and even in the park But they'll never Take my Jesus out of my heart. No, they can take away our rights to pray and even throw us all in jail. But they can't take away the life he gave. 
They can't send my soul to hell I looked about America and saw that there was much to do. The fields were white to harvest, but the laborers were few. I wanted to be used to make America a better place. But soon I became discouraged for my strength and wealth were small and my feeble little efforts seemed so futile after all. I talked to Jesus about it and asked him what to do. And Jesus in all of his wisdom said, let's make a better you.
Jesús. There may be someone watching online. Someone here this morning never trusted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. I pray that you'll come to him today. I believed in Jesus all my life because I grew up in a Christian home. I never made a commitment to Jesus. I was a 19-year-old boy in Vietnam. You're here this morning. You don't have 100% assurance your name's been written in the Lounge Book of Life. That you can have that assurance because eternity's too long to be wrong. By the way, folks, I'd rather be safe than sorry. God's Holy Spirit has spoken to your heart today at home here at Cornerstone, and you'd like to make that commitment to Jesus. The Bible says that if you'll confess with your mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord, you believe in your heart God raised from the dead, you can be saved today. July 25th, 2021 could be your spiritual birthday. If you'd like to make that commitment to Him as heads are bowed and eyes are closed, I'm going to ask you to pray this prayer right now. Silent in your heart as I pray it out loud. Would you pray this prayer? Dear Jesus, I know I'm a sinner. Without you, I know I'm lost. But today, dear Jesus, I ask you to forgive me of all my sins. Right now, Lord Jesus, I ask you to come into my heart to be my Lord and my Savior. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for saving my soul. In Jesus' name. Heads are bowed and eyes are closed. All over this worship center at home, you prayed that prayer. If there's a number on your screen, and it hadn't been the last few weeks, but if there's a number on your screen, you can dial that number. There's a lady here who'd love to pray with you. Let us know you gave your life to Jesus. Here's the time to make a stand. Here's the time to make a stand. If you're here this morning, you prayed that prayer from your heart. Say, Brother Jim, I made that commitment to him. Here's your chance to make a stand for Jesus. Pastor, I prayed that prayer. I'm not ashamed. If you prayed that prayer, would you raise your hand? Anybody? God bless you, ma'am. Anybody else? I pray to God bless you, sweetheart. Whoa! Anybody else? Bless you, sweetheart. Heads are bowed and eyes are closed. Come here, sweetheart. Come here. Sean, would you bring your... Sean, let's go. Come here. You raised your hand. Look right here at me. Would you pray that prayer with me, sweetheart? Thank you, Jesus. These two young ladies come this morning giving their heart and life to Jesus. God be the glory. You can be seated, Brother Wayne. 
Love this, guys. We got a whole bunch of our folks that's got COVID. Uh, I want to pray for those. Not just our people, but this, this strain is going again. But you know what? COVID don't scare me. You, know, you do the right thing. Do what you need to do, but don't act stupid. We want to pray for those that are home, who are always here. We want to lift them up to Jesus today. I want to pray for uh, Jan Botter for the chorus, Brother Shorty, Brother David Seaton. Pray for one another. I want to ask my daughter, my granddaughter, to come here for a moment. Come here, guys. See, uh, there's some things worth fighting for. Let's pray, church. Let's get together and pray. Let's pray for those people.